In the heart of Africa lies the Congo, quenched by its flowing river, furnished by meandering hills, and endowed with a myriad of natural resources, including ivory, precious minerals, and rubber. On the far end of Europe is Belgium, one of the smallest and youngest countries in the continent, disjointed by the breadth of its cultural divergence and lacking the political and economic knowledge possessed by other European countries. On the 9th of April, 1835, a man was born in Brussels, Belgium, almost 4,000 miles from the Congo. In spite of the distance between the two nations, his effects on the Congo are undeniable. His exploitation and destruction of the region and its people engendered problems that persist even to this day. His name was Leopold II, King of the Belgians and Conqueror of the Congo. King Leopold was born Leopold Louis-Philippe-Marie Victor, the son of Queen Louis-Marie and King Leopold I. He was one of four children. As a boy, Leopold was shunned by his family. A nerve defect caused him to walk with a limp, and his long nose resulted in his own mother describing him as, quote-unquote, bird-like and deformed. Although he proved careless in his studies, Leopold did develop a fondness for two subjects in particular geography and colonialism, an interest that would later manifest itself. Leopold served in the Belgian army through much of his early life, eventually achieving status as second lieutenant. In 1853, once Leopold had turned 18, his father decided that the time had come for his son to marry. The bride was Marie Henriette, Archduchess of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, chosen with the hopes of allying with her family's powerful nation. Their marriage, however, proved loveless and was not a top priority for Leopold. Leopold's desire to improve his own nation prompted him to explore the world in search of a president to increase Belgium's wealth and influence. For the next several years, Leopold traveled the world, visiting a multitude of nations including Turkey, Palestine, India, Ceylon, and Sumatra. He grew convinced that a colony would transform his young nation into a superpower. Studying Spain, France, and England, he recognized the economic opportunities that imperialism presented. Leopold's search was temporarily interrupted in May of 1865. His father had become ill. On December 10th of that year, the king died, leaving Leopold II as the monarch of Belgium. For almost 20 years, Leopold pleaded with the Belgian parliament for rights to establish a colony. Realizing that his efforts were futile, he sought a new means of gaining affluence for Belgium, establishing his own private colony. Following the example of various other European nations, he turned his imperial interest to Africa, 80% of which had yet to be colonized. In September of 1876, Leopold encouraged major European powers to convene in Brussels to discuss Africa's future at what became known as the Brussels Conference. Leopold called for forced eradication of the Arabic slave trade, hoping instead to westernize the continent and its people. Here, the International African Society was founded, with members including nations throughout Europe and even the United States. In January 1878, Leopold intercepted Henry Morton Stanley, a man famous for his quest to find Scottish missionary Dr. David Livingston. Stanley soon consented to meet Leopold in Brussels. During the course of the meeting, Stanley agreed to a contract for his involvement in establishing Belgium's presence in the Congo. Uh, the decision of Leopold to uh, uh, colonize the Congo should be put in its historical context where uh, Western European countries uh, all were very ambitious to, uh, to have colonies. And uh, Leopold had the feeling that uh, Belgium also needed that and, and that he uh, rendered uh, excellent service to, the, to, to Belgium by giving it uh, a colony. He prompted Stanley to claim as much land as he could for Belgium and to establish a monopoly in the ivory and rubber trade. Through over 400 treaties, chiefs unknowingly ceded their land to Leopold. Through these treaties and other manipulation, Leopold gained over 2.3 million square kilometers of land for his colony, the Congo Free State. In order to abolish the Arab slave trade, 
Leopold organized a group of European army officers, who in turn drafted Congolese soldiers to serve in the state's militia, known as the Force Publique. However, the Force Publique was mainly used against the Congolese people. The abuses against the native people soon became evident in all regions of Congo Free State. State agents would arrive in villages with armed soldiers, demanding monthly payments of resources. Villagers would be put to work as laborers in European homes, as porters, or to work the land. In some places, villagers were forced to work for free. In others, children as young as seven were sent to labor. Agents used brutal punishments and harsh laws, and although laws against brutality had been proposed in the Congo Free State, seldom were they enforced. Any district that failed to meet the requirement of goods for the day might be punished through public execution or village burning. The introduction of rubber to Europe was extremely consequential to the natives of the Congo Free State. By the mid-1890s, the Congo became one of the most prominent rubber exporters of the world. Each adult male in the Congo was to produce between 6 and 9 pounds of rubber every two weeks. The job was dangerous and difficult. Many died by falling out of the tall rubber trees or being attacked by leopards. One tactic agents used to encourage labor was seizing the women of the villages. The women were imprisoned until the village collected enough rubber, and many were raped by officers while in captivity. By the late 1890s, rubber was the most profitable resource in the Congo. As demands for this product grew, force public agents became increasingly more brutal to the Africans. Armies often raided towns, seizing laborers and food, and any person who rebelled would be shot. The tradition of collecting hands was especially prominent in the Congo. This practice was initially started to keep track of how many people the troops killed, and to make sure bullets were not wasted. When excess bullets were utilized, agents were known for cutting the hands off of live victims. In Belgium, Leopold was engrossed in his newfound wealth. He used Congolese wood to decorate his home and began building projects in Belgium and France. Initially, the harsh conditions in the Congo were kept from Europe. However, as time passed, Congolese missionaries and cargo men began to write reports about the violence. Only for a brief time, however, were abuses ignored. More accounts of violence and torture began to come in, particularly from one man, Edmund Morel, a rubber exporter from France. After observing the torture and slave labor being executed in the Congo, Morel grew determined to inform the whole world of the atrocities he had witnessed. In 1903, Morel started his own publication, The West African Mail, in which he published articles written by himself, other cargo men, and missionaries about the harsh conditions in the Congo. Another man, Roger Casement, was sent by the British Council to investigate the Congolese atrocities. In December of 1909, Leopold became ill, most likely with cancer. Doctors planned to operate on him. However, the day before the surgery, the king died. Before his death, Leopold ensured that all personal records of the Congo over the past 24 years were destroyed. In 1908, a year before Leopold's death, the Belgian government had annexed the Congo as a colony to the state. As a result of rebellion throughout the city of Leopoldville and a loss of Belgian interest, the colony eventually gained sovereignty in 1960. Belgium's sudden withdrawal left the newly freed Republic of Congo in a volatile state. Now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the nation is engrossed in a continuing conflict. One of the main characteristics today of the Congo is, is its chaotic situation. Uh, uh, since the disappearance of the Mobutu regime, uh, the country has been going through civil war and is still uh, in the eastern part very much going through civil war. So that is unfortunately the main characteristic today. Uh, Congo is very much what we call in, in the United Nations a failed state at this moment. Leopold II's struggle for a colony came at the cost of nearly 10 million African lives. The irony of his regime, sacrificing one group of people for the prosperity of another, has left a permanent scar in Congolese history. Although seldom visited and often ignored by modern society, the story of King Leopold II's life gives exclamation to the 45,000 deaths that still occur each month, as his shadow continues to linger over the Congo today.